Um, something flashy to draw you in. What's up gang? Welcome to Room and Board. My name is Chris George and today I am going to take you through my top 10 underrated games of all time. We all have them. Games that you love that are not necessarily critically regarded. Some of them may even be critically reviled. Some where you actively seek out review after review, desperately trying to find someone who will praise this game in the way that you know it should be praised. And anyone who doesn't agree with you is a dumb idiot. These are the underrated games, the misfits, those lost in the trash bin that I want to talk about today. And drop your underrated games in the comments because I want to hear about them. And while you're doing that, might as well like and subscribe if you haven't already. So how I made this list was pretty simple. The main criteria is that every game on this list has to be below the BGG Top 1000 which I'll break immediately for my number 10. But anything below a thousand I felt was really underappreciated. And basically these are games that I all enjoy, but I have them listed by rank or by how far away they are from making that top 1000 on BoardGameGeek.com. With the notable exception being number one, because I know how these lists sort of work and inevitably you'll skip forward to number one at a certain point in time. And so if there's one game that I want you to check out from this list, it's going to be the number one game. Because while I think they're all pretty fun, this one is exceptional. I've hyped you up enough that you can skip the whole thing. <laughs> Don't listen to the rest of it. Just go right now. Maybe you can come back after. So a few of these you may not have heard of, a few of these you definitely will have heard of. And all of them, I think, are worth a second look. And so I'm excited to think about them for a while and imagine playing them, so let's go. Because this first one actually clocks in at 627 on BoardGameGeek.com. And that's pretty high. And the reason this is here is because I really thought this was gonna be lower. When I first thought of this list, I thought, yeah, that'll probably be on there. And it wasn't, but I still wanted to talk about it because I feel it's like kind of an underrated gem. And also because while my girlfriend likes Orbis, See if I can reach it. Which is a game similar to Splendor, kind of, not really. It's by Space Cowboys, same people who did Splendor. You're a Greek god building a pyramid of terrain and sacrificing followers to do so. This clocks in at 1957. I don't necessarily love it as much as she does, and I think it's just fine. And I don't want these games to be on the list just for the sake of being on this list. I want these games to be more than fine. I want them to be pretty great. So she's going to be upset when she sees this, but... Uh, she got a shout out anyway, so it's 11. Which brings us to number 10, and that is Ex Libris. This is a worker placement game about shelving books in alphabetical order. It's time for you to make the best, most organized library. Is your interest turned off? You'd really think I have a thing against librarians on this channel, but not anymore because this game is actually really great. I love it because every game you're competing to shelve a different category of books and also the places where you can send your assistants and workers will come out differently every time. Plus each player gets their own unique special meeple that has its own special power. I am certain that the awful unreadable white text on a busy background knocked this game down a significant amount because it's really annoying. But it's a really solid worker placement game that plays... My last game took me about 45 minutes at two players, and it was a lot of fun. So this is my honorable mention that is above the 1000 count. And if you don't like it, well, then I'll say Etherfields, which is below, but I've only played one session of it before COVID hit, so... But there's too much of a sunk cost fallacy for me not to enjoy it later on. Number nine, clocking in at 1188, it is Barony by Marc Andre. I love Barony. It's but from the same designer as Splendor, a cross between Splendor, Catan, and Chess. This game has you harvesting resources and running your little knights around the board to secure particularly bountiful plots of land. My girlfriend despises Barony, so I don't get to play it as often as I'd like, but I think it is so good. Like Splendor, basically the person who can optimize their actions the most efficiently will win the game. But this one has the added component, added component, component, I've said that three times, but this one has the added component of maintaining that all-important area control. 
and direct player conflict of knocking other knights away and stealing plots of land from other people. On your turn, you can take one action out of, I think, seven possible actions, maybe it's six, and that's it. When someone is able to level up their pathetic noble all the way up to a glorious baron, the game is over, but someone else's baron may have been more baron-like and get there at the same time, and then they can win the game because they leveled up more pieces throughout. It's really tactical. It's great with two people. At three to four, there's a lot going on and a lot of people who are going to attack you and screw you over. But with two, it really does feel like a head-to-head -head sort of chess match. And I think it is underrated, hence its place on this list. Plummeting down 600 spots, we have a game that I think is gonna be pretty polarizing which explains how it found its way down here in this trash bin at 1792. This is probably one of the earliest games that I played as an adult. You can find it everywhere at Chapters or Indigo, and it comes in this great little banana hammock. That's what they call them, right? And it is, of course, Bananagrams. If you haven't heard of Bananagrams, and you probably have, but if not, it's Speed Scrabble. That's it. You build words in a crossword puzzle as quickly as you can, dumping more and more letters to your other players as they drown in a pile of letters and you two-letter word your way to utter victory. It's also very fun to play with the no two-letter house rule that I've had to implement because then you're constantly disassembling and rearranging your board as you play. But I happen to particularly enjoy words and word games, and this is such a good game for people who don't play games. Especially because I feel like no matter who wins, your brain wins. Is that cheesy to say? I don't know. That's how I feel every time I play Bananagrams. Whether I win or lose, I just really enjoy the frenetic experience of making my synapses fire quickly enough and assembling words as fast as I can. Unfortunately, I don't really get to play Bananagrams at all anymore because I'm pretty good at it. And even with doing it with one hand, a time disadvantage, and no two-letter words, I'm still usually able to demolish my opponents in a way that it becomes not fun for the other people. So I understand if you have people with different skill levels, this can really be not that enjoyable. So it's one that I haven't played in a while, but I still love it and think of it incredibly fondly and think it deserves to be higher up on the list. When you get something that's so mass market and that can appeal to so many different people, I don't know, people like to poo poo those sorts of games, but this has always been a fun one for me. And who knows, it's been a year of quarantine and the other day I had to search for the word shoes. So I may be past my Banana Prime days of glory. <laughs> and maybe I can get it out again. Continuing on the same theme, our number seven clocking in at 1873 on the BGG list. It is the incredible Dutch Blitz. And to the people who rated this game low, and made it appear so far down in the rankings, to you I say, I hate you as a person because this game is so good. If Bananagrams was Speed Scrabble, this is basically competitive speed solitaire. And you can pick it up for like 10 or 15 bucks depending on the store that you're getting at. It's 100% worth it. Basically, you're trying to get rid of your stack of 10 cards by moving them solitaire-like and putting them in ascending order, one to 10 in the middle. But everyone's doing this at once. So as long as there's that blue one in the middle, yeah, you can put your blue two in the middle. Everybody keeps playing until someone's stack of 10 is gone. They shout blitz in a euphoric blaze of glory. And then you get points for every card you put in the middle and you lose points for every card you weren't able to put in the middle. It's exhilarating, it's awesome, it's simple, and it is a heck of a lot of fun. A wonderful, good game. <laughs> I couldn't have said it better myself, Dutch Blitz. Uh, you'll see this blue one is the expansion. It doesn't matter. You can get a blue set or a green set. The only difference is you can combine them to make a game for up to eight players. So green or blue, doesn't matter. Moving to our number six, which clocks in at 2,256. It is a collaboration between two behemoth designers, Eric Lang and Antoine Bauza. 
letting you live that steampunk supervillain fantasy, it's Victorian masterminds. Yeah! The reason I don't have my copy, I don't know if you noticed, is because I lent it to my group of friends who all live together, thanks for inviting me, because they wanted to play it a bunch over quarantine, because they liked it so much. It's worker placement, but each of your workers has their own special ability, but they only get to activate once three workers have gone to this particular space. You're trying to build your own evil supervillain contraption, all the while still taking control over various buildings in various cities. And really, it's a race to see who can get the most villainy points until the military gets strong enough that they shut the whole thing down. Or someone completes their supervillain contraption and blows up the earth? I don't know. When I bought this game, before I had a chance to play it, my neighbor said, oh, yeah, that's not very good. But even with that smear campaign, I've managed to play it a bunch, and it still is a lot of fun. The main thing is it doesn't overstay its welcome. And if you like that sort of feeling of racing to get more points than your opponents and worker placement, this is a pretty decent one to check out. Number five, continuing moving downwards, as is our theme. This one clocks in at 2657, and this is a game that's been pretty much universally panned since it came out, but I still like it. That is the hated legacy game, Seafall. We're almost done our three player campaign. I think we've played about 16 games of this so far. And while it's not perfect, I definitely think it's worth a second look, especially because you can find it on Amazon or various places for like 30 to 40 bucks. This was over a hundred bucks when it first came out. And quite frequently, I've seen it as low as $15. I also had another friend group who had a blast playing this as well for like 90% of their games and they felt the ending was a little lackluster. But 18 out of 20 like fun games, that's a pretty good percentage. There was also this one huge combo that their friend kept doing that they couldn't stop and then they eventually just said, okay, we're not letting that happen anymore. <laughs> it's out of the rules. We must continue our campaign. And the rulebook is a little unclear, especially as it evolves. There are some moments where you're gonna have to look up things online and make a decision amongst your group how exactly you should play things. And yeah, I get it. I get the negative sentiments behind it, but for me and for the other five people whom I know who have played this game, it's pretty fun. Hopping in your pirate ship to go explore a bunch of islands and fight over who can get the most points. And I've thought about this a lot and I might be biased because I've won the majority of the games that we've played in our campaign, but the other two people who I've been playing with have both been aching to get back to the campaign because they've enjoyed it so much. Seafall is less about the destination and more about the journey. And it is really quite fun. Now, I'm not sure I would pay a hundred plus dollars with it because a hundred bucks is a lot of money, right? But at the 30 to $40 level, and if you ever see it for 20 bucks and below, which happens a lot, and you have a couple friends who you think it might be fun to explore the high seas with and potentially sink each other's ships with your cannons, on occasion, although when my friend Zach played it, that's all he did. <laughs> and then he was screwed for the remainder of the game because every single island and every player hated him. <laughs> I definitely say go for it. I think this one gets a lot of hate. And I also think a lot of that hate is from people who have seen the reviews and then just kind of parroted that and haven't given it a try. Definitely worth taking a second look if you feel like that's sort of exploration, competitive legacy sort of thing. Moving along to our number four, clocking in at 2763, it is this tiny little innocuous game called Masks. I honestly was really surprised to find this down so low. I expected it to be above a thousand because to me, it's fairly unique. It's all cards and everybody has a family and you're vying for control over certain favors that are scattered around this castle that's formed by cards with kind of spaces in the middle. But the neat part is you don't necessarily get to decide where your family members go because you draft your hand every round. So you could take your high ranking people or you could take the high ranking people of someone else and try to put them 
in a spot of the castle that doesn't really benefit them. It's a really neat little game. And it's one that I'm not likely to get rid of anytime soon. Now, I don't necessarily play it that often. And maybe that's partly because it feels like it should be a smaller game because it's in a smaller box. But there's actually like a decent amount of strategy here. But I think it's really neat. I think it's certainly underrated at 2763. In terms of small box games with some strategy, this is definitely one that I would gravitate to and definitely one that I would take with me if I didn't have a lot of space but still wanted a game that wasn't a party game or wasn't necessarily lighter. Because this can take like an hour, maybe a little bit more to play depending on what happens and depending on the player count. So it's not what you expect, but I think it's just really unique and I like it. So if you haven't heard of it, that's Masks. Now our number three, which is clocking in at 3,558, and that is Shifty-Eyed Spies. I learned about this game from a shut up and sit down, what to buy around Christmas video, and I'm really glad I did and grabbed a copy because it's just so dumb and I love it. I think it's just great, silly fun. You're a spy, and you always have two missions. Send a message to someone telling them at which of the four locations located at the four corners of the table you need to meet with them, but at the same time keeping your eyes peeled for a different signal from someone who wants to meet with you. And you can only ever do this by winking and glancing at the locations where you need to meet while at the same time everyone around the table is doing the same thing and you're also trying to intercept other winks from people who don't know you're looking for them of different spies trying to meet. It's funny, it's chaotic, and it provides a lot of laughs as everyone's tensely looking around the table. It plays four to eight. It's definitely better at higher player counts because there's more going on and more people who you have to look out for. So definitely check it out, Shifty Eyed Spies. Moving along to our number two, this is probably my most obscure pick on the list, and this clocks in at 3,673. It's from 2009, but it feels like it was designed in the 1990s. It's a pretty solid stock market game, and that is Masters of Venice. Just look at this monstrosity. <laughs> and if you thought the box didn't look appealing, well, the components are certainly worse. <laughs> and the board is worse than that. It's real ugly. And you're going to be constantly manipulating these different share prices and resource costs over time with these little pegs throughout the game. And a lot of people don't like it because they feel like that is too fiddly for their tastes. And it's also pretty long and involved. You're looking at like three hours, realistically. It says 90 minutes on the box. No. Even at two players, it's like just barely there. And the theme is as generic as they come. <laughs> but, and it's a big but, if none of those things turn you off, this is actually a really interesting economic game. I don't really have a stock market game other than this, so that's a plus for me. You get to bid on special abilities that only you have that last for a few rounds before you get to bid on different ones. You simultaneously select where you're going to put your person on the board. And some of the locations give everybody an action that they can do. It usually refers to buying and selling shares. And some of the places only you get to do something. You've got secret bidding. You can get money by holding on to shares of a resource that people are purchasing or sell them at the right time and tank the price. This is definitely not for everyone. But if you like heavy economic games, it's for sure one to check out. I don't know if it's in print anymore. I'm gonna guess that it isn't. But if you find it in a bargain bin somewhere or used somewhere for cheap, because people will be selling it pretty cheap, and you like this sort of thing, now you know about it and can say, yeah, I'll try it, but it is a real big time investment, so be warned. This one I'm a little less surprised is down on the list, but I'm very happy that I've tried it out because I like it when I'm in the mood. And finally, number one, clocking in at 3,074, and it is a travesty that this game is ranked so low because this, it is exceptional. 
It's so good. It is the inspiration for this list, and I'll probably do a full comprehensive review on this because I love it so much, and I'd like to break it down in its entirety. Because I'm not joking, this is currently my number two game of all time. And sometimes, depending on the day, it could even dethrone Rising Sun. It's that good. This is the best thematic game that I've ever played. Every single card has thematic implications tying back to the source material, because it's also based off of an incredible anime which I would probably put into my top 10 TV shows of all time, regardless of it being an anime or not. Even though this last season wasn't as mind-blowingly amazing as the previous three, this is Attack on Titan, the deck builder. It is criminal that this game is rated so low. Anyone who rated it low should be locked up or fed to a Titan. It's an incredibly difficult cooperative deck builder where you're trying to defend this wall from these brutally powerful titans who just want to smash it to bits and eat you up for dinner. And you have to kill four of the big bad titans to win the game. And it's brutal. And you will lose. Frequently. <laughs> Until you get the hang of it. And then there's a way to make it even more brutally difficult. <laughs> Being a big fan of the anime, my girlfriend bought this for me for a Christmas present. And oh boy. It just all works. Every single card ties in to something that's happened in the show. And I don't only enjoy this because of the anime. Let me be clear. There's also Attack on Titan The Last Stand, which, oh, where is it? This one, which is a one versus all, and it's just okay. Yet this was ranked somewhere in the 1700s, I think. And this is ranked at 3,024? Get out of here. <laughs> And if you like deck building with a board or challenging, really challenging, co-ops, I implore you to check this out. It's so hard that it feels unfair. And I know that that turns a lot of people off and is probably one of the main reasons why it's ranked as low as it is. But once you die a bunch of times and you figure out that learning curve and you realize, get the 3D gear at the beginning of the game, you may find that you will have a chance at surviving. And when you win, it is so rewarding and so satisfying. If you're a fan of the show, just go get it right now. Even if you're not, if you like deck building and you like cooperative, hard co-ops, check this one out. I'm gonna do a full review where I just scream at you more. <laughs> in terms of how good this is, and I'll break it all down there. You're staying here. So that's it. That's my list. My top 10 underrated games. Have you tried any of these out? Which of them do you like? Which of them do you hate? Am I wrong and these are all trash and now I'm trash and nobody should ever listen to me again? All possibilities, I'm sure. Anyway, let me know in the comments below, and if you're feeling generous and you enjoyed the video, hit that like button, subscribe if you haven't, because it's really, really helpful for me, and and I really would appreciate it quite a bit. Until next time, I'm Chris George, and uh, I still don't have a catchphrase, and at this point, it is getting embarrassing. So, I am ashamed. Bye.